Welcome to A Friend of Mine, a series of conversations with some incredible and inspiring women in business from regional and rural Australia. I'm Kimberly Finesse, your host and the founder and editor of Oak Magazine, and I cannot wait to introduce you to some amazing female entrepreneurs who will share with you their experience and knowledge of what it takes to start, grow and scale a successful business. So let me introduce you to a friend of mine. There's a whole generation whose lives are not on social media. Like a personal and private podcast, A Lasting Tale records the life stories of the elderly and dying, gifting their families with insight and the memory and intimacy of a loved one's voice. When Dimity Brazel's father and sister both died in a relatively short period, it was their voices that were achingly difficult to recall. In 2018, Dimity pulled up a pew with her mum, Anne, to record Anne's life story and capture her unique voice. Little did Dimity and Anne know that they would create a movement empowering older Australians to share their own life stories. A Lasting Tale has now recorded over 1,500 life stories through professional interviews, a free mobile app, workshops and community programs. The business has over 40 interviewers across metropolitan and regional Australia and is growing rapidly. In this episode, Dimity shares her background in journalism and adult education as well as the personal experience that led her to start A Lasting Tale. She discusses the importance of capturing the stories of older generations who often have valuable lessons and experiences to share. Dimity also talks about the challenges of scaling the business and the importance of maintaining quality as the company grows. Meet my friend Dimity from A Lasting Tale. Hello Dimity and welcome to the podcast. Hello Kimberly. how are you today? I'm so good. We are actually talking while I'm mid-magazine, so I'm just about to send it off to the printer, and it's so funny to switch between writing and audio. Yes, it must be really interesting, which I really understand how that is. I'm in the process of getting out 22 completed life stories to people in the madness of the Christmas rush, so I feel like I'm in publication mode too. 22. Oh, my yep. gosh. Yep. <laughs> how much, and I suppose we probably need to go into who who you are and what you do, but how much time would 22 interviews take? Well, you've got a couple of hours to do the pre-organisation with the elderly subject and their family, and then the interviewer goes and does it. That takes between three and five hours on site or via Zoom. And then our sound editor runs through it and does sound production that can take, well, anywhere between three and 10 hours, depending on the interview. And then it comes back to me and I, me and my team, and we go through and we run a transcript and we have a quality listen to make sure that everything that's going to the families is good to go. We mix in music and we send it out as a private podcast and a file transfer link. So that can take a couple of hours too. Oh my gosh. So I think, you know, 22, however many hours per thing. Um, I'm sure if I asked my seven-year-old, she'd tell you how many days till Christmas. So yeah, <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There are in fact about 22 days till Christmas. I think you might find. <laughs> Well, um, I'm actually looking really forward to this conversation with you. In saying that, though, I'm like thinking, oh, my gosh, how's my heart going to hold up? Because elderly people are very special in my life and your business, I mean, they're the core of it. So I thought we might ease into it first. Yes. Uh, and let's talk about your background, how you came to do what you do. Well, for your listeners, um, my name is Dimity and I did a arts degree, I suppose, is the beginning of um, getting into this kind of journalism work. I read books as a child, my number one love, and then I went and transferred that into a arts degree majoring in English in Canberra at ANU. And then after that, I graduated with an arts degree. Some of your listeners may laugh. So what was I going to do then? Hey, um, so then I got a job <laughs> in the year 2000, moved up to Sydney, had a great time at the Olympics, um, all the management left and we just partied really hard for two weeks in an office in Circular Quay. Uh, that was fun. And I started out writing legal reports 
in financial services and I moved into financial journalism in that way in financial training and I was doing that for about 10 years in Sydney. I ended up working on a, a really early stage, they call it a startup. Uh, now, but back then it was just a new business, a really early stage online magazine actually for financial advisors. And we did training videos and um, magazine content. And back then that kind of stuff was really new. Uh, So I became the managing editor of that and ended up being in charge of, you know, all of the journalists there. And then I became a freelancer when I moved to London and stayed um, as in the finance field. So really my specialty is finance, journalism and education. I also did an adult education degree then as well, which I actually think gives a really good overlay to what I do at A Lasting Tale. That's the thing. It's your storytelling skills that you use and I suppose hold the memory of a loved one's voice. So A Lasting Tale, I've followed it for a little while now, Dimity. Uh, You've been in the media quite a bit, which I think is always such a good thing, especially with with what you do, uh, just opening it up to so many people to discover you. Uh, And I'd love for you to tell me, what was the catalyst behind A Lasting Tale? I have been in the media a bit, which is great. Now, the catalyst for A Lasting Tale is, so I did all of that. I came back from London, still freelancing um, in my field of financial journalism and adult education. And I had three children then in quick succession. I moved back to the country, uh, which was Wagga Wagga, and now I live in Albury. Actually, so that was in 2011, and at that time, my father, who was 79, who had been sick for quite quite some time, um, he passed away, and then um, pretty sadly, not long after that, about three months after that, one of my elder sisters also died. Um, her breast cancer came back, so she died quite quickly in the end, and she left behind a 12 year old daughter as well. So, you know, that was a pretty tough time for our family. Uh, For me personally, I also had my first child at the same time because, you know, sometimes life all happens at once, doesn't it? It And actually that was really beautiful. That was a really joyful and happy experience. And um, she was a great sleeper. Maybe I got a, I was really blessed in that, in that perspective. So anyway, those things happened and our family all just kind of sat with that for a while as families need to do. And then I moved to Aubrey. I had a couple more kids and I started listening to podcasts a lot um, because they, this was back in 2011, which is actually a pretty long time ago now. And and so I started listening to those a lot. They were just becoming pop, uh, popular, but I noticed that nobody was really doing them as a private service um, and that it, people were still like writing books or doing their own thing, but no one was capturing the power of someone's story in a private way for families to really hear things that you're not going to put on a public podcast. And that also that the people that get um, interviewed for public podcasts are people like me who have a business to sell or a book or you know, something like that. So I want, I started to think. And so I, I, the first interview I did was with my mother, Anne, who was 85 at the time. She's now 90. And, um, and so we did her together and I talked to her about the idea of a lasting tale. And she actually has been really instrumental and very involved in how we set up the business and how we run it. And even though she's not active in the business now, she's in aged care, she still loves um, hearing about um, all the interviews and the business side. And she's very excited that uh, we, have, we have achieved such great success, particularly in the last year. So mum was my first. Yep. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I'm thinking also that perhaps Anne being involved in the work that you do is probably good for her, you know, just keeping her um, sparked there for a little bit as well and, and involved and, you know, being able to carry a conversation rather than just, you know, asking how the weather is. I mean, that must be a really special thing to have together, sort of, you know, being 90 in those late stages. Oh, it's really great. We're really good friends, um, mum and I. Uh, I'm her youngest uh, daughter, um, but 
uh, mum has had nine children over a 23 year age gap. So um, there's a couple of us down down the end. And so mum and I have always been really close. We're quite similar in many ways. And she started a bookshop in Wagga. She um, is the original OG, really. She was, um, she um, helped start the Women's Refuge. She was on boards at Charles Sturt. She's very involved businesswoman herself. And so doing something like this is not only keeping her engaged and involved, but actually using her skills, which I think is really important to um, to know that you're being involved in something because you're still useful, I think is a really important uh, message there that we're all still useful, no matter what age, which is something I discovered from all of my interviews, actually. You would too. And I'm, oh my gosh, your mum is the OG. She is, <laughs> she is. Yeah. <laughs> what an incredible role model to have. Um, and look, just to have that many kids. I mean, I've, I've got four and I think that's too many some days. It's sort of hard to keep count. And um, on top of everything, I just think, oh my gosh, any more than that. Um, I definitely lose one. But just such an incredible bond that you have. And as I said, an amazing role model for you. What is it about the elderly that you love? Uh, oh well they're just people just like us um and they all have really amazing stories to share and they're actually the generation that we um currently interview we know I mean obviously anybody can um engage us for an interview and we do a range of age but our real sweet spot is over 85 um so the uh, parents of of kind of anybody from 45 to about 65 so that generation itself is really interesting they remember a little bit of world war ii they were born in the 30s they lived through a really interesting time um they have also not a very recorded generation most of them have hardly any photographs of them unless they achieved um well-known success they're not in newsprint they're not on a radio file there's no videos of them apart from a few kind of um there might be some stills and stuff or or you know that old 45 inch film uh but they're a very unrecorded generation particularly when you look at say their great grandchildren uh, who you know have had photos taken of them on phones since the day they were born you know so I find that really fascinating about that uh, generation, actually, because also I think they're in a really interesting time. They're living longer than any other previous generation. Uh, we all know there's a lot of problems and stuff in, in aged care and how it's run. We're not here to talk about that. I think what we're here to talk about is that behind every single one of that older person who's still living and can be sometimes difficult to think about how to care for that person every single one of those people have contributed to our society they've can made our families they've made our Australia the way that it is and they actually all really still have valuable um, lessons and stories that really should be shared and it's when you say lessons uh, really valuable lessons that you can take from that I find as a journalist, I think it's just such a privilege to be able to interview people. And, you know, you're not only the conduit for telling their story, but I don't know, you almost come away from it a lot wiser, you know, knowing something that you didn't already. Is there any lessons that you've learnt through interviewing these people, like, you know, those that are sort of over the age of 85? Do they have any life lessons that, you know, you've stepped away from an interview and gone, oh, actually, I, I should do more of that or, or that's a really good way to, to look at life or, or anything like that? Yes, you learn something from every single interview. And I mean, I know that our Melbourne journalist, Susan, she's like, I'm just learning so much what people value, what is actually valued at the end of life. And, and what we learn is what is valued is what you would expect is um, the relationships that they've had with people, the relationships that they still have, the real lesson that what you put into the world is what you get out of it. There's also the lesson of are not needing nearly as much stuff as what you think you need. That's a really big lesson. And that towards the end of life, everybody really does that cliche about you look back and it's all about the relationships and the love that you have, not the stuff that you accumulated is like, it's actually true. Outside, of course, 
um, the necessary ways of looking after your family and giving them opportunity and, and all of those kind of things. Um, that's important too, but actually the relationships that you form and that old adage of um, love one another as I have loved you, they, they just say iterations of that all the time. Also, just today I was listening back to an interview and that it's never too late to reinvent yourself. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to do something different. You know, there's a lady today who took up meditation when she was over 75 and, and changed her perspective on the world and is still talking about the powers of meditation and what that does for you. Can I just say one last thing? That actually people face great adversity and that time helps and that there are ways and tools to work through the things that have happened to you and that the old people in your life have those tools. You should ask them about it. I'm just thinking even of our own kids, Dimity, and just how they don't listen to us. But, you know, do you think it's because we're at an age where uh, I think we're, we're so open just to that knowledge and wisdom and experience and you know it's almost like just tell me if it's going to get better or tell me how to make this work or whatever it is um it must just be as I said just an absolute privilege to to listen to their their life stories I think so and we're often capturing it for families because they want their children or their grandchildren um to hear the stories and I think that you know when you're 20 you're not really that interested. But what the families are engaging us for is for when that 20-year-old is older and wants to hear those stories again or wants to hear that advice that it's there, that it's been captured. I think that's the important thing, that it's when you want to listen to it, you'll be able to access it. Do you love the idea of taking the hard work out of shopping, knowing that someone else has curated for you endless apparel and homewares options that are high quality, often handmade and always beautiful? At Vivian Kate, the focus is on natural fibres and a timeless earthy style. You'll find high quality clothing in classic styles, unique homewares such as cow hides and handmade ceramics, gorgeous aromatherapy based skin and body products and so much more. Personally, I love the selection of jewellery. Karen from Vivian Kate is all about connection and understanding what you need and she offers a personal styling service by appointment. Karen loves to support other regional women in business and has a wide network of talented friends from all over the country whose work she stocks in store in the beautiful regional town of Yakandanda in northeast Victoria. The Vivian Kate website mirrors the charm of the bricks and mortar store, ensuring you can access the same carefully selected items with just a click. Find out more by visiting www.viviankate.com or check out our show notes for links. So you recorded your mum Anne's story in 2018. When did it become a business? Well, it kind of started as a very small side hustle then. So I interviewed Anne and I was really interested in the side of teaching people how to do it themselves, um, giving them the questions. And, you know, because I have that um, adult education background as well. So I ran workshops locally in Albury and Wodonga and Wagga and, and really teaching people how to do their own private podcasts and the questions to ask, which I still do have our do-it-yourself 70 life story questions. So I I really started it in that end, Kimberly, not the professional interviews side of it. And so you could say that I started it as a side hustle when instead of watching Netflix one Saturday night with my husband, I decided to set up a Squarespace um, website instead. And sometimes when it all gets a bit too much, I think, God, I should have just watched that Netflix <laughs> series. <laughs> it would have been a really sensible idea. Uh, <laughs> And then I think that thought and then I go on. And um, so that's how it started really on the DIY side. And then I entered a few pitching competitions. I developed an app, which we can talk about later. And then people started to ask me a bit to do interviews of their own loved ones. So I just started it really small, um, really cognizant that although I was a trained journalist and all of that, my actual in front of camera audio was pretty low. So I did a lot of free ones. I did a lot of trial ones and I just really slowly worked it out and I suppose over the last five years I've I kind of had a 
um, aha moment when I realised that actually lots of people love the idea of a professional one, of a trained journalist interviewing their loved one for them, which is so about a year ago, I put out the feelers and I signed up freelance journalists, very experienced ones all around the country because I realised I could no longer go and do all the interviews where they were coming from. And, and that's kind of where the model started. So I suppose there's a business journey there between starting out with one idea that I'd take over the world on do-it-yourself kind of uh, audio life stories, working out that that wasn't the best way and then moving into this kind of professional way. Being able to just scale it as well. And I mean, it must take a lot of trust in those freelancers as well, like to find someone that you trust to go and interview a family because sometimes when it is that older generation you don't get a lot of goes at it either you know it's sort of just that time where you can just go that once and and get it so how have you found your journalists like how has that happened and how have you built trust with them yeah, that's a really good question. I found the journalists uh, through a variety of ways. We got um, we got names of people. We approached people we knew had profiles that might be interested in the work that we could see had experience. Uh, we put out a, a ad on this great place called Rachel's List as well, which. Uh, is this fantastic closed um, journalism list. You should take a look into it. Uh, and it's it's excellent. That was really excellent. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Rachel's List, actually. They are excellent. They seem to have every great journalist uh, on their books. And that was a really good way to get metropolitan ones. And so I suppose what we needed to do in the first place of establishing trust is to make sure that the people that we got on our books were people that could do the interviews, that could do an interview with one shot, that had the professional skills and expertise as well as the compassionate nature to be able to go in sometimes with a lot of family pre-research, sometimes with not very much at all, and be able to establish rapport and to make somebody feel comfortable to share their story. It's not an easy task, actually, um, and it's not a particularly easy job. And it is very difficult to go back and for a second run. We don't. We do do some interviews over Zoom, um, of course. Uh, for people they're often younger but even then if you've told somebody your life story it's not it's not cool for that person to go I'm sorry that didn't work can we do it again Mm -hmm. that's not that's 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 not cool so and then to establish trust I suppose we've really boomed since about July this year and we've been using lots of our journalists you know, we just have really clear procedures in place. Um, we have very clear expectations from us and then we look after all of the post-production for them and we just make sure we give feedback and some really love it. They get really into it because it's, as I said, it's hard work, but it's a real privilege. Oh, it absolutely is. And um, I think you nailed it there. And I mean, I obviously with what I do as well, I know exactly what you mean when you say you have to go in and build that rapport really quickly Uh, and it isn't it is not an easy job to do and also sometimes when you're listening to someone's story you know some stories are really hard to listen to Uh, so it's about being professional Um, and although you may be a journalist you're still human it's still really hard to keep those walls up sometimes so if for the ones that you have on your books uh, do you touch base with them at all at any time and just say how are you after that one are you okay do you need any support Yes. So when you scale really quickly, that's all those kind of things that you encounter that you never really had to encounter before when it was just you. So we are now really establishing a process uh, to do that. And and with difficult one, when you hear difficult things, I will always follow up with them. And we always have a follow up at the end of every interview anyway, where they send through their notes and, and talk about that. Um, and we follow up with the subject if there's something that has been flagged there and the families as well. So um, there are things that we will follow up with. Uh, We are getting better and better at that process. Um, um, That's one of the keys about this trust element and about scaling up really fast is that sometimes you go, oh, my goodness, you know, I need to make sure that that happens. They're the kind of things that keep me awake at night, absolutely. 
Yeah. Yep. Uh, and that's the thing, you are running a business. So what have been the other challenges that you've faced in the, in the business? Uh, yeah, so the scaling up really fast is very exciting, but is challenging for those kind of things that you think, right, um, I'll keep you up at night. And, and then what we're sending out is still of a really high quality that can be, you know, um, that's, that's something that you're just constantly trying to maintain. Um, and we're all only human beings sometimes, but we're constantly trying to maintain that. You've got to keep up the quality as you scale. And also doing that segue from the do-it-yourself into the professional interviews, that was really challenging. We went and developed an app. Um, This is back before COVID, actually. Um, So we developed an app for people to do it themselves that also had an interface of how you could book an interviewer. And that was a really expensive learning um, I've also learned that you never say you make a mistake. You just always say it was a learning. So <laughs> um, it was a learning and, it, you know, it was quite expensive. I learned a lot about building an app and there are, you know, there are lots of app people and developers that are very interested in building an app for you and taking your money to do that. So if I could share one lesson is that a few people told me to really spend a lot of time doing a proper prototype and testing it with potential users and everything. And I didn't do that enough. I didn't do it to the extent that I got the advice to do that. And so I give that advice again (laughs) to the next person. Don't do what I did. So the app is currently offline, but we are going to put it up again because it did, like all mistakes, it did, you know, we got a lot of uh, our initial press was about that app in COVID. It's a good kind of um, marketing tool, a kind of free marketing tool. Would we still be where we were today without it? Perhaps. So I suppose that's probably a big mistake that I made, though it is still going. So, you know. Yep. <laughs> um, I was just thinking to myself, I've got this uh, club membership and well, it was a directory to start with. And it's probably the same thing. Like you build it and you you have the idea of how it's going to work and I don't know, it, it just didn't, it just didn't take off the way I wanted. And so it sort of, you know, sat there and paused and then I think it was just coming back one day and, and rejigging the whole thing, thinking about the value proposition of it, you know, making it more of a premium thing than for anyone. And, and I mean, it's still a work in progress, but it's definitely working better than it was that first initial. So it was more so thinking, okay, that first one for me wasn't a waste of time. It's, yeah, as you said, you've got the bones of it. It was probably the same for me. I've, I've got the bones of it there. It's built. How do I make it work though? And, and sometimes it's just not the right time for your business or not the right time for, for the people, your customers as such as well. So mm. um, yeah, it's, uh, it's always a journey. It's always an expensive lesson sometimes, but if we can make something better out of it, it worked. It's a success. <laughs> I think you're totally right. And another learning is the whole retail versus wholesale. Um, You know, like going to the retail market, the wholesale market is, you know, it is very difficult to crack into and you need to have retail sales in our business to keep the business going in order to develop things like with aged care homes and retirement villages on a wholesale basis. But we need to keep the retail sales going so we can get the backing in order to go for those bigger kind of batch clients. So, of course, getting the retail takes up a lot of your time. Like it's a real chicken egg situation. Dimity, I didn't even think about wholesale for a lasting tail. Mm. Like I hadn't even thought that that would be a revenue model for you. So even that's just interesting in itself that I suppose every business there, there is a possibly a wholesale option there. But as you said, it's so difficult. And when I, when I talk to retail people especially or creatives that are trying to get into a retail store, a bricks and mortar store, it's always their biggest question. Like wholesale, how do you price it? What does it look like? You know, how do you contact these people? What do you need to take to them? So much involved in it. Oh yeah, there is. And there's so much involved in like setting pricing, establishing value, all of those kind of things. And now that we're running like journalists and sub editors, I come from quite a creative family. I've got some sisters and nieces who are musicians and we've always been involved in drama and all that kind of thing, you know. So that is always something that's kind of run through our family. And and so I kind of liken every single life story to its own little production, 
right? <laughs> so you're doing a mini production that involves, you know, that, and that is very important to that subject and their family. That's their production for the year. They don't know that you've got another 22 productions that have to be out before Christmas, you know. That's not really their concern. So that constant juggling and remembering that to each person, this is really super important and to treat that production with the quality and the love that it deserves. That's how I kind of approach it. Yeah. So if someone was thinking about using a lasting tail, and it might not be today, but it's something that they can work towards, are there things that they could be doing in the lead up to that to make it easier for everyone involved in that production? Well, the hardest thing is if you want your loved one, your parent or grandparent to do a lasting tail, the main block will probably come from them. (laughs) Um, So they might say, I don't have anything to say. My life hasn't been very interesting. Um, Why would anybody want to hear my story? Or I've got things in my life that I don't want to talk about. And so there are many ways to just start a conversation about that, like maybe over Christmas or into the new year or into anything like that. Maybe just sit down and start asking them a couple of nice questions about their life, like, you know, tell me what Christmas was like when you were a kid and what was your favourite food when you were a child, Nan, and all that kind of thing. So start the process of memory and recollection, get out some photos, start talking about it, start just having a conversation. It doesn't have to be some scary kind of, we're going to sit down for an hour and do this, just have a conversation. Uh, Everybody in the whole world loves talking about themselves. They do. It's a universal thing. That's what makes us human beings, you know. So start that process. Uh, And also I think there's a bit of fear in our generation that to our elders, I think we get a bit scared that if we bring up something like, I want to record your story, that we're implying, I'm just going to put it bluntly, that that person is going to die, right? And and so I think that that's our problem, actually. That's the problem of our generation, that we don't want to bring it up. Because if you're asking your 85-year-old or 90-year-old grandmother or, or father, to record their life story, they know that they are much more in terms with their mortality than you are, you know. So I always advise people to just say, particularly at that age when people are older, just say, I think we should record your life story. Don't you think that would be a fantastic thing to do? It's just an enjoyable thing. I just want stories for the grandchildren and I'd love to hear about your story and I'd really like to capture it before you're gone. Like, be honest. And I think that's it. I mean, I could do a whole other podcast on that broader conversation around how we miss out on the opportunities to talk about a lot of things with everybody in our lives, whether they're elderly, whether they have a diagnosis of something. Um, We miss out on those opportunities because we're human and we're scared of talking about that stuff. That end of life, yeah. You always think that there's there's more time. So obviously I knew about a lasting tale and uh, my grandfather passed away and those that follow Oak uh, know that my grandparents are really close to me and it was when he passed away that I sort of said to Nan you need to write stuff down like we need to get some of this down like I don't want to be standing up there like not knowing what to talk about or just not having those memories and I suppose that's a thing you know you always do think you have time and then before you know it sometimes you you have weeks sometimes you have no notice you know, and I suppose for me, it's it's too late to wish uh, that I had have captured their voice because that's sort of one of the things that you say is is the first memory to go is the sound of their voice. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, I mean, I can't pull out all the scientific stats now, but that is a known fact that you forget the sound of a loved one's voice. I mean, I'm sure there are many listeners that are agreeing or people that play back voice memos and things like that. Also that our voice is uniquely ours. There is no other voice like ours in this world. So that's what I've always pushed upon. And and I think you do raise a really great point, which is that it can be really hard to ask somebody to record something and it is very easy to put it off and it can be too late. And if it is, it is, you know, you've got lots of other great memories and all of that kind of stuff. I I really, I really understand. I suppose that's just why I like to spread the message for people. Just do what you want to do with it. Just ask them a couple of stories if you like and press record on your phone. 
just ask them who they're proud of, like what makes them proud in their life and, and why they might be proud of their children or why they might be proud of their grandchildren and just press record. And if that's something that you get, that's awesome, isn't it? Oh, I'm, I, it's a yes from here. I'm trying to keep myself <laughs> together. <laughs> like that's an amazing question, Dimini, like to ask someone. It's not tell me about Christmas or anything like that, but yeah, things like what makes you proud? and why like oh gosh that's that's what yeah like I I would ask about Christmas and stuff if you're asking somebody healthy to perhaps start engaging in their memories and you want to start that conversation but if you're towards the end of someone's life and there's no time to have a three-hour life story collecting all their memories that's the question I'd ask yeah yeah (laughs) there you go trying to pull myself together um, yeah I know even I'm feeling a bit emotional oh, it's, um, <laughs> about it it's memory sorry this is what happens isn't it and they're not sad memories they're just memories yeah uh, but um what you do have on your website is that uh 70 life story questions uh that is what someone could purchase and start and I'm assuming that those type of questions would be in there that question's in there, absolutely. That's one of the questions that we always we always ask that question. We're journalists, we get family research and we base our questions around that, but there are a few questions that we ask at the end of every interview um, and that is one of those because that's a joyful question. It's not. It's asking for an expression of love. That's what that question is about and that's what we all want, them and us. It is, end. isn't it? We just want to yeah. be loved. That's yeah. Um, gosh, and this feels so inappropriate to say, but I was watching um the Love Triangle on Stan, <laughs> and there's just a character, and I just kept saying to my husband, she just wants to be loved. That's all she wants, <laughs> and that's all that's coming to my mind right now. Terrible. Um, but I haven't seen it. Oh, I'm sorry. Please don't, don't waste your time. <laughs> I was about to say I don't. I I don't have Stan, but I have just watched the la- the first four episodes of season six of The Crown, and I think there were a lot of people in there that just want to be loved too. Oh, I can't. I don't know if I can go yeah. there yet. I'm, I'm looking forward to it though. But um, yeah, it's, I've just got to get this mag set away, and then it, as you said, it's that whole weekend of Netflix doing nothing. <laughs> I feel like a lasting tale is one of those gifts that you all come in as a family. You put your money in and you you get something that the whole family can then share and enjoy and obviously, you know, treasure those memories and, and capture that life story. So I don't know. I, th- I think it's the, the perfect gift um, as well. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Kimberly. Yeah. And <laughs> we have gift certificates available for purchase on our site. Uh, so, uh, and I think, and we do have families that pull together and purchase it as a gift. And then we, you give the gift and then we organise, we call the subject after they receive the gift and organise the interview. It so really, and it's, it's the, and also you get the experience of the gift certificate and then they get the experience of preparing for it, the experience of having the interview. Um, then, you know, you get the experience of listening to the story. Like it can be quite a fun, it's a fun little production. Mm, yeah. yeah. And, and obviously passed down through generations after that. And that's probably a thing, Dimity. There'll be people that listen to these, these recordings, these life stories, probably when audio is an old thing and there's something new out there oh absolutely yeah like in about eight months you know (laughs) yeah like I like to think like I mean I have so many thoughts about our recordings you know there's all this work on VR experiences for the elderly and there's a lot of work in the in the dementia space and all of that which I'm not uh, an expert in in any way shape or form but I do think that there's so much work and talk about um, how we can assist as we grow older with with memory as experiences for when we might be suffering with dementia. Well, if we don't catch the memories in the first place in some form, that's going to be a hell of a lot more difficult to apply the tech over the top of it. So, you know, like I, I think that every day. I think this stuff is important. Oh, it is, absolutely. Well, uh, this is a huge change of gears. Uh, it's to wrap us up. It is my favourite question though, and that is uh, if you could share with us a friend of yours that you think we need to know about. 
Yeah, I have two friends and they're both interviewers for A Lasting Tale. The first one is Bronwyn O'Shea, who runs Story Up. She's Wodonga Wangaratta and she is an ex-ABC journalist of about 15 years. And Story Up, she calls herself Regional Australia's Storytelling Specialist. She is an absolute legend when it comes to creating content telling people how to create their own content, group workshops and everything, I highly recommend going to Story Up and looking up Bronwyn O'Shea. And my second one is our interviewer in Canberra and her name is Emma Gray and she's also a, a journalist of long standing but she's also a very up and coming author and has written a number of books and she is really gaining traction and the last book she wrote is called The Last Love Note and she's currently on her US tour for that and The Last Love Note it's about a woman in her 40s whose husband died when she had young children and it's a romance and it talks about her grief and finding love again and honestly it's such a great book guys so that's called The Last Love Note and I think you should all grab it. Well, Bronwyn, I actually know of, and I would have to also attest that she is incredible, uh, have been interviewed by her. And I think any sort of any opportunity I would get to to be around Bronwyn and just her expertise, I think is uh, definitely well worth it. But yeah, I think there'll be two people that our listeners probably haven't heard of before. And yeah, perfect. Yeah. Love it. There you go. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for having me on the podcast. It's my pleasure and, of course, everyone can read your story in our issue 13 of Oak Magazine. So this is just a a nice little add-on where, you know, people can read the story and then obviously listen to your voice and that, that brings it all to life. That's right. Thank you. Thanks. Now, before you take off with all that inspiration and knowledge, we'd love for you to leave a review on our podcast so that we can continue to amplify women's voices in the media. And if you have any questions, we'd like to celebrate a win can always connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Oak Magazine AU. I'm so glad we've met and that now you know a friend of mine.